Right. We are going to go ahead and get started this morning. Uh, welcome. It's beautiful, absolutely gorgeous weather outside. I like, uh, I like the pre-fall stuff. I don't really mind fall so much, but I do not like what comes after it. I don't like being cold, but that's okay. That's all right. It's kind of part of where we live, and I wouldn't change it for anything. We do have a couple of birthdays coming up. So Judy's got a birthday uh, on the 22nd, and Joy has one on the 25th. And seeing as how they're ladies, we're not going to know how old they are. We're not even going to ask them. So that's kind of the, the rule. I was taught that a long time ago by my dad. Never <laughs> ask a woman her age. Not a problem. Won't do that. Will not do that. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. We do have a meet, uh, deacon's uh, ministry meeting this afternoon, uh, immediately following church. So it shouldn't take too terribly long. We're just going to go over a few things and kind of get our minds thinking. Uh, fig leaf on Saturday, October 7th as well. Second. Second. That does say two. Second. There is not a Saturday, October 7th this year. There is a Saturday, October 2nd, though. So that is, that is good. Um, I don't think there's really anything else to go over here. So I do want you to think about this morning just, just briefly. Because the reason why I'm rushing things a little bit, we've got a special one that's getting ready to sing by these girls right here. If at any time during their song you see their microphone go down, point at them and tell them to bring the microphone up. They'll get used to it. They'll be fine. They sound great. It was a, a great rehearsal. Uh, but this morning, what I'd like to talk to you about in just a minute. So as a parent, I understand there's, when your kids are playing sports, anything, there's a winning team, and then the rest of the teams lose. And I know it's difficult sometimes for little kids. I understand that completely. So, we've come up with a trophy, and then we've also come up with participation trophies. Now, I'm not really making fun of too much of the, of the participation trophy, but the only reason why I'm, I'm telling you this is because I wanna, want you to put you in a perspective of Satan. This is the only time you're allowed to think as Satan would think, okay? In church, believe it or not. So I want you to think about this. Your life, your life and how you live it, if somehow, some way, Satan were to capture you and bring you over to his side, would you be considered a trophy? of his. Would you be considered a trophy? Would your life that you've lived, he's like, man, I, I won this guy. I won him over to the dark side. We'll say the dark side for all intents and purposes. Would you be considered a trophy? Or would your life just be considered as, ah, come on, all right, come on over. You're the participation. You've just participated in life. Think about that for a second. How Satan would actually view you and your life. If he would win you and put you up on the mantle as the highest piece going, I, I won that soul right there. Or would he just kind of grab you and just kind of throw you along the way as somebody else? Guys, the reason why I wanted you to think about Satan just for a few moments is that think about your life and how you live it. And are you, I, I talked to Lauren briefly this morning she told me she was persecuted for being a Christian. She was made fun of. Now, let me, let me kind of put things in context with her real quick. She was made fun of because she told some other kids that she would only date a Christian. And she was made fun of for that. And they kept making fun of her and making fun of her to the point where she was crying. Let me tell you something. I'm so proud of you right now. Stick with that stuff. You would be, your life right now would be a trophy. That's what Jesus wants. If you're not being persecuted, even just a little bit or a lot, you're not living your life as a trophy. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for today. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Help us to be just, just bold in everything we do, Lord. Help us to live our lives for you. Lord, help us to uh, um, just, just, look into the Bible and look at the examples that you've set through us, through you and through others that you've uh, put as examples in the Bible, Lord, and help us to live our lives that way. Lord, help us to not be afraid. Help us to not be afraid to share our faith with others. Help us to not be afraid to stand boldly when others are making fun of our faith, Lord. 
Lord, help us to just be strong Christians, Lord, to be warriors for you, Lord. We love you so very much. In Christ's name, amen. 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 It's a great morning to be here in the house of the Lord this morning, worshiping with our church family. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning. I'd like to invite you to go ahead and stand as we sing our first song this morning.
to sing the next song, which is, I need thee every hour, I wanted to read 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 3. And it talks about our, the Lord's comfort when it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And in Dan Ortland's book, Gentle and Lowly, he describes God's comfort this way. <clears throat> God has a multitude of all kinds of mercies. As our hearts and the devil are the father of a variety of sin, so God is the father of a variety of mercies. There is no sin or misery, but God has a mercy for it. He has a multitude of mercies of every kind. As there are a variety of miseries with which the creature is subject unto, so he has in himself a shop a treasury of all sorts of mercies, divided into several promises in Scripture, which are but so as so many boxes of this treasure, the caskets of a variety of mercies. If your heart be hard, his mercy is tender. If your heart be dead, he has mercy to liven it. If you be sick, he has a mercy to heal you. If you be sinful, he has mercies to sanctify and cleanse you. I really like this last part as he paints this picture. As large and as various as are our wants, so large and various are his mercies. So we may come boldly to find grace and mercy to help us in time of need, a mercy for every need. All the mercies that are in his own heart, he has transplanted into several beds in the garden of his promises where they grow and he has the abundance of variety of them suited to all the variety of diseases of the soul. Oh 
Now this next song talks about a victory, so if you need to stand up again during this, feel free to go ahead and do so.
The girls wanted to share this song this morning. This is a song that we sang almost every day at camp, and it really grew that week to mean a lot to all the kids that were there. And so... where I lay it down every burden every crown this is my surrender this is my surrender here is where I lay it down every lie and every doubt this is my surrender and I will make room Here 
is where I lay it down You are all I'm chasing now This is my surrender This is my surrender Here is where I lay it down You are all I'm chasing now This is my surrender this is my surrender. You've done good. <laughs> Thank you, girls. Turn in your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 5, if you would. John, chapter 5. Boy, it feels good to have a voice again. <clears throat> I missed that last week a little bit. Um, and, and I did find out that uh, I am allergic to uh, essentially everything that produces pollen. Um, so that was kind of, you know, interesting to find that out the other day that when the doctor, you know, tested me and he's, they, she said, yep, you're allergic to, yeah, just about every tree that's out there that we test for. Let's see, all the grasses, yep, all those as well. The noxious weeds, yeah, you've got all those too, pretty much. So um, <clears throat> at least now I know what I'm allergic to. Um, and, and, and my voice has been able to kind of heal a little bit as I've been able to go back on my allergy meds. Uh, boy, the past 18 months have been somewhat of a train wreck for a lot of us, for a lot of the world. A global pandemic that isolated us and, and still seems to isolate us to some degrees, to some degree. Uh, it's brought loss to so many people. I, I don't know anybody that hasn't known somebody that has had COVID. And a lot of us have lost people that we love to the disease. Here at the church alone, we had a damaging water leak back in February. <clears throat> Today is the seven-month anniversary of the day that we found that leak. And we're still not completely restored from it. We're still dealing with some of the issues from that water leak. And to say that that added a little bit of stress in, into my life and into the life of a lot of other people is kind of an understatement. I, I mean, it did thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of damage, and it slowed our ability to return to really a more normal experience here at the church. Of course, our country and the world has been dealing with political upheaval and the social upheaval that we've had in our own nation. Uh, I mean, that's a train wreck. I don't care who you are, that's a train wreck. And then you add in, and I could add, you know, each one of you has individual stories of things that you've gone through over the last 18 months. You know, those are just the big picture things, you know, from the church perspective and from the world perspective and from our country perspective. But each one of us could also then add in our own personal little train wrecks that we've had to go through. <clears throat> More now than ever, we all need, I think, a dose of hope. But the problem with hope is this. For most people, I'm afraid, hope is so easily crushed. It, it tends to be a flimsy structure, one that readily collapses when placed under stress. And we have all been under a lot of stress these past 18 months. And so what we need today, I think, is a better understanding of hope and a more solid basis for our hope now, I'm going to read this verse, and you're going to kind of scratch your head probably and go, what in the world is he doing reading this verse when I'm trying to preach on hope? I will get to it. Just trust me with that, all right? So you're going to have to have a little patience. Uh, stand, if you would, please, in honor of, of God's word. Let me read to you from verse 45 of the fifth chapter of John. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. So, Father, we pause here and we ask you to help us to understand better 
what hope is supposed to be, what it's supposed to mean in our lives. And most important of all, what the one true source of hope can be in our life. So speak to us today, Lord, I ask through your word, through what you've had me prepare, use this, Lord, to your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I know, again, it, <clears throat> you might go, okay, where in the world is the pastor going with this one? Well, I will get to this verse, but first I want us to talk a little bit about that word hope. Because a lot of people use the word hope, but I'm afraid they misunderstand what it should mean. See, here's how most of us, you know, if you were to ask people, you know, well, what is hope? I think for a lot of us, hope comes down to this. It's wishful thinking. Now, I know, you know, some of you are football fans. You know, football's kicked off. We're into week two already here. How many of you hope that your team wins the Super Bowl coming up in, you know, at the end of the year here, at the end of the season, right? But what's the reality of that hope? It is wishful thinking. I mean, it's wishful thinking. Some of us root for teams that probably aren't going to go to the Super Bowl this year, no matter what happens for them. Some of us are rooting for teams that we think, man, we got to get back. We were just there. And it's wishful thinking. What is hope? For most people, I'm afraid, that's what it is. It's wishful thinking. It's a desired outcome that we want. Go ahead and advance the next couple of things there. All right? And this wishful thinking, here's the problem with it. You know, that's what a wish is, right? A wish is a desire for an outcome. And I hope, you know, and, and I admit, okay, I'm, a, I'm one of those conflicted individuals. I have two favorite football teams in the NFL. I have the team that was my home team when, when I left Washington State, the Seattle Seahawks. But I've now lived here for almost 20 years. And my second team is, is the Kansas City Chiefs. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of torn. I hope one of the two of those goes to the Super Bowl and wins. Amen. But the reality is there are 32 teams and only one's going to go and win. It means 31 aren't. I know we have, you know, Pittsburgh Steelers fans here and Denver Broncos fans here. And, you know, I don't know. I think we have even maybe, I don't know. Well, no, he's more of a Chiefs fan still, I think. But every now and then he gets a little weird over here and he starts rooting for those Texas teams. <clears throat> but it's all just wishful thinking. And the problem with wishful thinking truly is this. There's no foundation for it. There's no basis for it. I mean, even as good as the Kansas City Chiefs are, and they're pretty good, it would only take one key injury, and the season would probably be over. And none of us can predict anything like that. And so when we use that word hope, and all we're thinking about is wishful thinking when we use it, that's a recipe for disaster. Just like a building without a foundation is a recipe for disaster. <clears throat> Before we, when we used to live in Virginia, I decided I needed a storage shed in my backyard. So I don't know, we went to Lowe's or something and we bought one of those build-it-yourself storage sheds. And I gathered a couple of guys from the church and they came and they helped me build my storage shed. And one of the first things one of the guys asked me was, well, did you put down a concrete pad for a foundation? No. I was going to put it on the ground. Well, did, did you level the ground really well there so it's nice and level so we can kind of put down a wooden you know, foundation? No. It's just going to sit out there. I'm just going to store stuff in it. And that shed lasted maybe a year before it started falling apart. Um, <clears throat> the doors were never really... You just couldn't quite get the doors to shut correctly. Uh, it was unstable, and uh, it was a disaster. You see, I had hoped 
that it would stand just fine. But all my hope was, was wishful thinking. And the shed turned out to be quite an embarrassment, really. I wasted my money. Because it eventually just fell apart. Because there's no foundation. There was no basis for it. And that's what happens with our hope. When it's wishful thinking. When there's no basis for it. When there's no foundation for it. A storm's going to come along. And it's going to blow your hope apart. And all of a sudden you're going to be sitting somewhere. Circumstances of life pouring in upon you. The train wreck happening, and you're in the middle of it. And you realize, I have no hope. And that's a desperate, desperate place to be. Unfortunately, I think it's where a lot of people are today. So that's misunderstood hope. Let's talk a little bit about misplaced hope next, though. And this is where we get into, we'll get into a little bit of this verse uh, that we read at the beginning, John chapter 5. But before we get there, I want to read another verse to you, actually from Proverbs chapter 26, verse 12. And Proverbs chapter 26, 12 says this, Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. There are three bad hopes, three bad places where you can try and put your hope today. And this verse in Proverbs points to one of them, ourselves. <laughs> and, and the reason why is we're too limited in our own understanding. We, we don't understand the world well enough to really hope in ourselves. <clears throat> Plus, and again, I know I'm... I'm I'm speaking to people that are far better at this than I am, and I get that. I fail. I know you guys don't. I I mean, I know you guys live perfect lives, right? And I understand that. You're all perfect. Right? You have no sin that you deal with during the week. Your thoughts are always pure and right before God. Your lips always speak the praises of God and, and the words of Jesus are what comes out of your mouth. And your hands and feet are constantly 24-7 involved in doing exactly what God would have you to do. I know that's you guys and not me. Oh. You mean you're walking the same path I am? Sometimes you fail? Which is why we can't put our hope in ourselves. We fail. Solomon said there's more hope for a fool than for the man who thinks he's wise in his own eyes. See, if I think I know everything, if I think I've got it all figured out, if I think I have the wisdom to direct my life with no need of any outside assistance, the fool is better off than I am. You know, you got the wise man here, you got the fool here, and then you got the guy that thinks he's wise in his own eyes. Wow. So if my hope is in myself, I am lost. Because eventually the train wreck will hit. And I'll, be finding, and I'll find myself sitting in the midst of the chaos that my life has become with no hope. Because I've misplaced it. I've put it in myself instead of in who it needs to be placed in. Then we get to this verse in, in John chapter 5. Ah. Oh. And Jesus, again, talking, saying to to the Pharisees, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. So here's two other things that we can possibly have a problem with when it comes to putting our hope in the wrong place, misplacing our hope. And the first one is when we start placing our hope in someone else, some other human. Because the same problems that I have Limited understanding, the ability to fail so easily, you have also. And so does every other single human being walking the face of this planet. If I put my hope in someone else here on this planet, some other human, my hope is going to be destroyed. 
because eventually they will fail. Eventually they will let me down because they have no better understanding of life than I do. And they're going to fail. And Jesus here told the Pharisees, here's who's going to accuse you. It's going to be Moses. You've put your hope in Moses, in this person, in this man. It's the wrong place. But there's another side of this. When Jesus says, <clears throat> it's Moses that's going to accuse you because you've put your faith in, the, the, he's the one who, on whom you set your hope. There's another aspect to this that we have to understand because tied to Moses is the law. Moses was the law giver. <clears throat> and so when Jesus says, the problem is you've set your hope on Moses, he's also saying you've set your hope on this religion that you've built up around the law that God gave you. And now all of a sudden you're hoping that my religion will save me. I'll follow these laws and these rules and that'll, that'll save me. But the problem is we can't follow them. We fail to follow even our own laws and rules. That's what religion says. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, and you'll be fine. And Jesus here is telling the Pharisees, the leaders, the spiritual leaders of Israel, if that's what you've put your hope on, you've lost it. It's not going to get you there. That's not what God wants of you and me. Because there's no power within the law and the rules to help us to follow them. There's no power within them to save us when we fail to. In fact, all the, the rules and the laws and the regulations and the, the do this and don't do that things do for us is condemn us when we do fail. So our problem is we either misunderstand hope and we just think of it as wishful thinking or we misplace our hope and we put it in ourselves or we put it in someone else or we put it in something else like religion. <clears throat> and misplaced hope is no better than misunderstood hope. And, and again, Solomon said it well. If we, if we think we're wise in our own eyes, if we think we can figure this out on our own, we don't need help from anybody else. We're worse off than the fool. If we put our hope in humanity or religion... We're just condemned by those very things. Humanity will fail us and even the best of us cannot hope to, be, to save someone else, let alone save ourselves by following some rules. In fact, if all we have here is religion, we're lost. Religion is not going to save us. If all we do here is religion, we're in trouble. Because we've placed our hope in the wrong thing. <clears throat> so I want to share with you here in these last few minutes, my hope. My hope. And before, and let's understand what I mean when I say hope, okay? And I hope that you will adopt this for yourself as well. So when I ask the question, what is hope? For me, hope is not wishful thinking. For me, hope is a confident expectation. You see, <clears throat> I can't confidently expect a football team to win a championship, a baseball team to win a championship, a basketball team to win a championship, a hockey team to win a championship. I can't confidently expect that. I can wish, but I can't confidently expect it. And that's the difference. See, my hope, I don't say that I hope the Chiefs win. I say it'd be fun if the Chiefs win. It'll be fun if the Seahawks win. 
I'll even, it'd even be fun if the Steelers won. I, you know what? Because you know what? Let's face it. This whole thing that we do with all these sports teams, everything else, you do understand that it's just a game that's played, a children's game played by adults for our entertainment. And does it really, really matter who wins? I mean, we put so much money and time and effort and energy into cheering for these sports teams. And I'm guilty of it at times as well, but the reality is it's a game. A children's game played by adults for our entertainment. So I don't hope that any team wins. It's just fun. When I use the word hope, I use it in this meaning. It's a confident expectation, which means I have confidence in something or someone. I'm assured that at some point in my hope, there is a truth contained in it, a validity contained in it. That what I am hoping on is truthful, is valid, it's real. It's not going to evaporate on me when things go away. And that expectation, that simply means the outcome is assured. So when I say, I place my hope in Jesus and in him alone, well, there's truth there. Who is Jesus? He's the son of God. What did he do? He was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a cross that was not rightfully his to die upon for my sins and for your sins. He died a real physical death. He was buried in a tomb that he didn't own. It was borrowed. And on the third day after he was buried in that tomb, he rose again to life. And there's truth there. You go ahead and try to prove otherwise. And you'll find out like a lot of very, very smart people have done. When you try to disprove that, you can't. There's a validity in the fact that when I put my faith, my trust, my hope in Jesus, something changed within me. I became a different person. I still remember standing with one of my friends a few days after I'd given my life to Jesus, and he asked me if I wanted to go out and party with him that night. And my answer to him was, no. And I was kind of confused at first because it's like, that's always the thing we always would go and do on Friday night. We would go out and go party together. We were underage, but we'd go find whatever we needed to find. And all of a sudden, I didn't want to do that. Because the validity was that Jesus changed me. And so I have an expectation now that he's going to continue to change me and that he's going to bring me into the promises that he's left for me. Psalm 39 verse 7 says it this way. And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. My hope is in Jesus. See, I'm not going to hope in governments. I'm not going to hope in, in, in science. I'm not going to hope in all these things. I'm going to hope in Jesus. Because all those other things, they're going to fail me. My hope is not in humanity. It's not in a religion. And it's certainly not in my own understanding. My hope is in my Savior. My living Savior, Jesus. And in the eternity he has promised me. Psalm 62, verse 5 says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. For God alone. Don't put your hope anywhere else in this world. Put it in God alone. Put your hope in Jesus. He's the one who died for you. He's the one who rose again to life. And he's the one that's going to be coming back for us. So put your hope there. Not in all these other things. Because all these other things keep failing on me. The one thing that's never failed me is Jesus. All right, let me, let me conclude with this. Psalm 147, verse 11 says this. But the Lord pl- takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. So 
let me remind you of this. If you think about this, maybe this will help you. Your hope is in God's steadfast love, his unchanging love for you. So when things are going wrong for you, remember God's love for you has not changed. If you'd been here earlier this morning, you would have seen me sweating like crazy because I was running back and forth trying to figure out why Amy's guitar wasn't working. I, I, you know, I mean, and that's a big thing. I mean, I want to make sure that, you know, we have as good an experience coming from here with the worship team that, that will help you all worship properly. And all of a sudden, one of the key instruments that we used was gone. It wasn't working. And I was running back and forth upstairs. We were changing out cables. I was looking at the soundboard. I was about ready to start pulling my hair out. And in the midst of that, my wife pulled me into my office and prayed for me. And I was reminded, you know what? God still loves me. It'll be okay. The worst thing that will happen is the live stream won't hear Amy's guitar playing. Because you'll still hear it in here. Even without the amplifier, you can still hear it. So it's like, you know what? This will be okay. Calm down a little bit. Your hope isn't gone. God still loves you. This is a little train wreck, not a big train wreck. By awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation. Psalm 65, 5. Take hope in God's offer of salvation. Take hope in this. You're not so far gone that God can't save you even today. There's nothing you have said or done in your past that brings you to a point today where God cannot save you, where God cannot forgive you. Take hope in that. There's nothing, nothing. Oh God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, There's nowhere I can go that I can escape from God's love, from God's offer of salvation, and from God's promise of eternity. See, I could live a really, really long life here by human standards. And it's absolutely infinitesimal compared to the eternity that God has promised me. Every single train wreck in my life that I experience here is going to be nothing in eternity. So if I, if, I, if I focus on God's unchanging love, if I focus on God's salvation for me, if I focus on eternity rather than here, then nothing that happens here will cause me to lose my hope because it's not based on anything here. Have you ever watched those Prudential commercials? <clears throat> right? Prudential has the, the, the rock of Gibraltar, uh, you know, that they use to symbolize how trustworthy and how strong and, and how faithful and reliable their, their company is. A company that you can put your hope in because they're not going to let you down. tell you what, I have a lot more hope in Jesus than I do in any company on the face of this planet. The evidence is there for anyone that wants to look at it. The history of the people who have experienced true life change is there if you want to take the time to talk to them. And you can experience the same thing today in your life. Hope. Hope for tomorrow. Hope for today. Not despair. It doesn't matter what the train wreck is that you might be going through. Your hope is in the unchanging love of God. If your hope is in his salvation that he is offering to you, if your hope is in the eternity that he has promised you, the train wreck of today means nothing compared to that. So if you've lost sight of hope lately because of all that we're going through, let me encourage you to stop looking at what you're going through and start looking at Jesus. That's where you're going to find your hope. That's the only place you're going to find it. So, Heavenly Father, 
as we conclude this service today, <clears throat> we declare you are our hope. You alone, Lord, are the one that we can put our hope in and not have that hope shattered as a result. So help us today, Lord, no matter what the train wreck is that we might be facing, help us today to turn to Jesus and put our hope there. Help us today, Lord, to take our eyes off of our circumstances and put them onto your promises, your eternity, your salvation, your love, so that our hope will not be shattered. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask you to stand as we sing this uh, hymn of prayer, please.
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the day. Thank you for the opportunity we've had to gather together in this place, in the place you've provided, with the people that you've brought together. It is no accident who has been here today. We thank you, Father, for your drawing. And just ask you, Lord, to use today what has been said, what has been sung, what has been prayed, all of it, Lord, to your glory. And help us, Father, to remind ourselves of the hope that we have in you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today. You are dismissed.